what makes you feel safe? Physical safety is one of our most fundamental needs, and generally speaking, we're a lot safer now than we were a thousand years ago. Most of us aren't worrying about things like dirty water, disease, wild animal attacks, and the elements every day. But something that hasn't changed after all that time is that just as important as physical safety is emotional safety, the feeling of security that gives us peace of mind. And when it comes to feeling safe, something that's often just as important as actual physical safety is the symbols we put stock in, the ideas that help us feel safe, secure, and comfortable. Today, we'll look at two pairs of symbols that, although they date back over a thousand years, are still a common sight all over modern China. The door gods and stone lions. Join me, Jer Christie, as I explore the hidden legends that shape the world on The Mythographist, Myths of Mainland China. Stone Lions In the days of the Han emperors, envoys from the distant western lands come to the Middle Kingdom. They have long heard tales of its artisans and its craftsmen, its herbalists and alchemists, its philosophers and sages, and now they come to see for themselves. Though in these times there were great empires striving against each other in terrible wars and grave conquests, the ones who make the journey are explorers, brave and curious, and they have crossed vast deserts and endless mountains to see the wonders of the world that the others in their lands have never even dreamed of. They come in peace, and with them they bring wonders of their own, pigments, fabrics, stories, creatures, all fabulous and unknown to the Han courts. And there is, at this time, one ambassador in particular whose peculiar wares will ignite both trade among these distant peoples and a new art that will spread across the whole Han nation. Look, he comes toward the great and sprawling capital Chang'an, a caravan of horses and camels winding down from the foothills and across the plain. Messengers arrive, heralding his arrival. He is the ambassador from a kingdom called Persia, only the rumor of which has ever reached the emperor's ears. When he enters the palace gates, all the anticipation that has preceded him cannot compare to seeing his caravan in the flesh. The Han Emperor and all his court are fascinated at what the Persian ambassador brings with him. The wealth of foreign lands, the weapons of strange cultures, the crafts of unknown hands. But what intrigues the Emperor most of all is one large iron cage. Or rather, what that cage contains. It is a beast that no one in all the lands has ever seen. It is huge, bigger than a tiger with a long tail like a whip. Muscles ripple beneath its yellow fur, and its forelegs are powerful and tense, as if it is waiting to jump on its prey. And around its neck is a collar of long, flowing hair. The creature roars in hunger, and its keepers send a living goat into the cage. What is this? asks the emperor. Never have I seen such a majestic beast. This can only be Swan Ni, say the emperor's most learned men, trembling, the fearsome son of a mighty dragon. The ambassador laughs. A lion, he says, giving them a word for the thing they behold for the first time. Mighty indeed, and the protector of our great empire. I have brought him as a gift to your imperial grace. So enamored with the lion is the emperor and the court and the whole city that word spreads quickly. The emperor installs this strange beast as the guard to his palace, and it is the pride of his menagerie. The emperor is generous and returns blessing for blessing. In return for the lion, he gives the Persian ambassador fine embroidered silk, the specialty of Chang'an, whose texture is so smooth that no Persian, even one who has dreamed of touching a cloud, can imagine it. He gives gorgeous crafted porcelain, inlaid with gold and strong enough to drop on the stone floor. And he gives spices with aromas and flavors so rich and intoxicating that they fill a man's dreams. From this single event come two more. First, the man named Zhang Tian journeys in turn to Persia. 
He is a great Han ambassador, explorer of lands and roads, and through the knowledge he brings back to the Han kingdom, traders begin to use the route that today we call the Silk Road. Second, though only one lion lived in Chang'an, so mighty he was that the emperor wished him to guard every important building. So the royal stonecutters fashioned a pair of lions to stand outside each entrance, one male and one female. This was very fashionable, exotic, exciting, and the lion grew in popularity throughout the whole city. Soon all the people of Chang'an desired lions for their doors, and so it was that the stonecutters chipped and polished and crafted stone lions large and small for every home that wanted them. This practice spread first through the city, then through the nation, and there was made a standard. The male holds the world pinned under his claws as the emperor rules over all, and the female plays with her cub, who rolls beneath her paw. Even today, stone lions of every size can be found guarding doors, chasing away evil spirits and wicked men, and keeping those inside their walls safe from harm. The information age is great, but I really love imagining what it would be like to discover the existence of something as substantial as a lion for the first time. Can you imagine somebody rolling up in your town with an actual dragon? Something you could never even have dreamed of being real? This chain of events, or something like it, happened in the middle of the Han Dynasty, probably around 200 BCE. Persia was on its way out in the Mediterranean while Rome was on its way in. The Chinese capital of Chang'an is present-day Xi'an, where the terracotta soldiers live, and the whole region is famous for its embroidered silks. Zhang Qian is a historical ambassador revered as a bridge from China to the West, and is partly responsible for opening up the Silk Road. The Mandarin word for stone lion is shi shi zi, with the first two characters having different tones, but otherwise the same pronunciation. The shi meaning lion, probably comes directly from the Persian language, as their word for lion is sir. Stone lions go by many names in English, but are often called foo dogs from fu, the Chinese term for good fortune. If you're still not sure what I'm talking about, look no further than the cover art for this podcast. That's a photo of one of the stone lions I owned when I lived in China. It looks big, but in reality it was only about six inches tall. Just the right size for my apartment. It does seem evident that only one lion was brought by the Persian ambassador, and that it was a male. Although the carvings claim to depict a male and a female, they both have a mane, which would be a very forgivable assumption for an artisan to make after only seeing one specimen of such a foreign animal. Menchen, the door gods. In all the world, there is not a single person who enjoys lying down to sleep at night knowing that they are in danger, that enemies are near, or that they will be disturbed during their night of rest. So it is that beside the doors of houses, near and far across the lands, we place pictures of fearsome warriors. We call them Menchen, the door gods, and they are posted on the right hand of the door and on the left to guard the house, and those inside it, against any evil that may come. But what is their story? Who are these spirits who stand such watch? There are many, and their memory stretches back as long as stories may reach, but I will tell you today of two called Qin Shu Bao and Yu Qi Gong. The beginning of one kingdom always means the end of another, and rare it is for that transition to be friendly. Indeed, when the Sui dynasty ended and the Tang began, the rebellion was bloody and within the walls of the royal palace there were none who had clean hands. Not even when new peace was established, though, were the emperor and his court safe. Intrigue and treachery abounded, and the first Tang emperor, Gaozu, who had waged war against the Sui and overthrown them, continued to fight off contenders for his throne, even among his own children. When the time finally came for him to pass his rule on to the next generation, he chose his son, Li Shimin, 
to take his place. Li Shimin is still a young man, not yet thirty, when he takes the name Emperor Taizong, and the deeds he did while bringing his father to power still haunt him. Every night he lies awake in his royal golden bed, thinking back in horror on the blood he spilled. And when he falls asleep, he fares no better. Legions of the ghosts of his enemies torment him. They parade through his mind and call his name and speak his deeds and demand that he join them in the underworld. It is after months of this that one of his advisors speaks, sire says the wise man. A man cannot rule his life if he does not sleep. Without rest, his mind will fail. Surely, too, an emperor whose mind is forever besieged by the ghosts of the past shall never be able to rule well. Therefore, sire, send for your most trusted soldier and set him as a watch over you while you sleep, and the spirits that trouble you will see him and be afraid and leave you be. But, despairing, Emperor Taizong states, Your words are good, but the souls that seek my own are beyond number, and their anger knows no bounds. I fear the demons will not fear one man any more than they fear me. And the advisor replies, Surely the spirits are as fearsome as you say. Forgive me, for I have not seen what lies within the emperor's dreams. So then, let the emperor take his two bravest men, those who stood at his side through many battles that already cast fear among the spirits that haunt. So Emperor Taizong relents, whether seeing the wisdom in it or realizing that it certainly cannot make things any worse, and he calls for two generals more loyal and fierce than any within the whole kingdom. Qin Shu Bao is unmatched in his bravery and skill with his two golden mace whips. He has led the soldiers called the Emperor's Deathless in battle, and is a shrewd and focused warrior. And Yu Qi Gong has never met his equal, either in strategy or in combat. His iron sword breakers have saved his Emperor from army and assassin alike. So Yu Qi Gong and Qin Shu Bao stand guard at the door of the Emperor, one on either side as he sleeps. And behold, the ghosts of the emperor's enemies recognize these two men and tremble in fear and flee back to the underworld, leaving the emperor to a peaceful sleep. Night after night, the two men return, and night after night, no spirits come near to Emperor Taizong. After many weeks of this, the emperor asks his watchmen how they fare. Qin Shu Bao and Yu Qi Gong say nothing only ask whether his majesty is well. But when the emperor looks upon their faces, he sees that they are tired. My friends, he says, tell me, do the souls who once haunted me now hover over you? Tell me truly, do not fear. Finally, Yu Qi Gong, who the courts say lacks tact, answers, O emperor, it is my privilege to serve you, he says. But I have two wives, two brave warriors of the western lands, one with light skin and one with dark, and I fear that they have need of me, though they want for nothing. And then Qin Shu Bao speaks. My liege, there is no greater honor than to guard you. But the count of my battles numbers more than two hundred, and the blood I have lost could fill dozens of cups. And I fear that illnesses plague me now in times of peace, as much as fighting did in times of war. Emperor Taizong looks in pity on his loyal guards, who would not complain though their troubles were great. And he thinks, such loyalty and this is how I repay them? It is not good for them to grow ill on my account. So he calls the royal painter into his presence. Come, the emperor says, paint the likenesses of these two men, one upon each side of my royal door, that they may return to their homes and tend to their lives, and still guard my sleep against the demons that would torment me. In this way, Yu Qi Gong and Qin Shu Bao guard the emperor, though they return home. 
And, as is the way with royal habits, this practice spreads first through the palace, then through the city, then through all the kingdom, and it has been passed down ever since, even to us. So this is why we put their fearsome images beside our doors, that they may frighten away the spirits of our past that may seek to do us harm. There are dozens of pairs of door guards, or menshen, used throughout China, some more fantastical than others, and when I was asking people for this legend, I was honestly really hoping I would get some stories about the green-skinned guy or the guy with the tiger for a pet, but I didn't. Yu Qigong and Qin Shubao seem to be the most well-known, as well as the ones with the best established backstory. Although, in a few weeks, we'll meet Zhong Kui, who has a similar story associated with him. All four historical figures in this story, the two emperors and the two guards, are real and well documented from contemporary records. The stories surrounding this particular dynastic transition between the Sui and the Tang, which occurred around 618 CE, are exceptionally action-packed with lots of good backstabbings and betrayals. Actually, both Yu Qi and Qin started out fighting against Emperor Taizong. Qin then defected and wound up fighting Yu Qi, who defected as well not long after that. Another version of this story appears in Journey to the West, written almost a thousand years later. It involves heavenly deities instead of emperors, and different affairs than dynasty wars, but keeps Qin and Yu Qi as the guards who come to defend against spirits that trouble a ruler's sleep. I assume, without any basis, that the story related here is the one on which the episode in Journey to the West is based, however, it's just as likely that this quasi-historical account was inspired by the tale told in the 16th century novel. I also have to say that, for both the Stone Lions and the Door Gods, most people don't seem to actually know these exact stories, so it's hard to say that the stories themselves are essential or foundational. However, both stone lions and the menchen are ubiquitous. You'll see them in temples, houses, businesses, garages, every other type of building in every art form imaginable, from sculptures to paintings to silk brocades to graffiti. They're so deeply ingrained in China's cultural and visual landscape that this series would definitely be incomplete without them. Thanks for listening. This episode of The Mythographist was written, narrated, and produced by me, Jer Christie, with research by myself and Elena Tung, and music by Xiaoqing Luna Li and the China National Orchestra. If you liked this episode, stick around because there's lots more where this came from. Subscribe to get notified automatically when The Mythographist updates, and be sure to check out the rest of the episodes on your favorite podcast platform or on YouTube. Finally, if there's a story that you grew up with that has shaped the way you see the world, I'd love to hear it. There are so many stories out there, and the more of them we hear, the more we'll understand each other. Remember, we can't learn if we don't listen. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you next time on The Mythographist.